Great. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you everyone for having me this afternoon. Uh, thank you, Professor Sophie, for uh, inviting me over. Thank you for all the organizers for letting me share a few thoughts, which are based on the, my recent PhD thesis, which looked at uh, the experiences of students on higher education campuses, Shi students, uh, in the UK. So I'm going to get straight into it so, so as not to waste time. Of course, you can't see <laughs> what it says behind the ribbon there, but it's just an introduction to how today's presentation is going to be structured. So firstly, we're looking at uh, the background of the research, and then we'll be moving on to, because the background and the backdrop of the research has to do with religious authority, we'll be looking at that and then looking specifically at Shi experiences of religious authority and taqlid, which I know, is, of course, is not an exclusive term to Shiism, but has specific or particular inflections in how it's performed in the Shi'i context. Uh, this part I've put, I had it there and I put it in circle because this part, unfortunately, I don't think we'll have time to delve into. Uh, it might come up in the Q&A, but um, the idea of gender was a huge salient theme uh, of my research, but we won't be able to go into that too much. Um, and then we'll be looking at the ways in which Shi'i religious authority practice is being restructured and um, reimagined, if you like, in during my research, and so how that's moved away from how orthopraxy, you might say, is defined by Shi'ism, and then in conclusion, um, how that serves as the student societies of Shia Muslims in the UK acting as agentic spaces uh, for that reconstruction to happen. So, straight into it. The background, of course, it was a qualitative research looking at 12 Shia Muslims in higher education in the UK, um, and of course, that pool of participants is significant uh, for a number of reasons. I'm, I'm sure the, this cohort here is probably quite well aware of um, what writers have said about higher education students and why looking at them um, puts them in a very particular area of interest. Of course, this area of people, again, as Appleton speaks about them, of course, this, he's not talking about Shi'i Muslims specifically. If I'm not mistaken, he's speaking about uh, Muslims of a Salafi nature in, in what he was uh, researching. But the idea that for Muslims especially, because perhaps of their cultural backgrounds, um, going to university, coming out of university, going through higher education, puts these students in a very particular area of influence. And so Shi'i Muslims in higher education were my uh, focus. The research... There's just some details about what, how the research and how the fieldwork was um, constructed. And the qualitative research, of course, encompassed quite a few methods. However, what you'll be seeing um, as a result of this, this presentation is going to be focused on or going to be concentrated on what came out through the data from the focus groups and the interviews primarily. We're not really looking at um, the participant observation and uh, what that led to necessarily, although that might feed into it a little bit. So, as I mentioned, the research was questioning uh, and was revolving around the attitudes and performances of religious authority amongst these Shia Muslim university students uh, at those eight campuses we mentioned. So looking at forming the backdrop, if you like, of authority, religious authority first of all, and then its inflection in the Shi'i context, and this is where I was pulled up on my Viva, actually. And <laughs> they said, all your fieldwork is fantastic, but we need more theory uh, as a backdrop to what you're talking about in terms of religious authority. So I really had to unpack that quite a bit. And if we want more reading on it, uh, Dr. Ali Reza Bojani, who is now at the University of Birmingham, and uh, Dr. Morgan Clark at Oxford, I believe he's at, uh, have written this article together, have really unpicked um, authority and religious authority Theoretically, so that's, that article from them is really, really something quite useful, it was very useful for me as well. So they've asked all these questions about r the nature of authority, and especially when it comes to religious authority. What does it mean? What does it entail? Um, what does it lead to? And all of these questions we're going to be looking at uh, as well. And then looking at Shi authority specifically, and how it might differ from other um, author religious authority in other contexts wider than Shi Shiism and perhaps even wider than Islam. The nature of religious authority in Shiism is quite specific. So in terms of 
uh, religious authority. Looking at this article here, religious authority or its nature has been defined or has been looked at as the ability to correct practice, to define what correct practice is. Um, not only that, but of course, also the ability to marginalize, punish and exclude notions and ideas that are looked at as deviant or sideline them away from, um, or I think it's called cancel culture now, cancel culture comes into it and all that. That's religious authority seems to have the ability to do this as well. In terms of what is uh, authoritarian, and in terms of authority and authoritarian, this is what I was looking at in my research as well, I've dipped into the ideas of Khalid Abul Fadl, who speaks about uh, religious authority in this way, saying an opinion on a matter that presents itself as a point of view, and that acknowledges that there are other points of view which are also possible, that he doesn't define as authoritarian. However, if, and he speaks about it in much more detail, of course, he talks about the triangle between the reader of a, spirit, of a religious text, the text itself, and the person he's passing it on to, or, or the author, in fact, which is God, of course, in terms of the Quran, author, text, and reader. But if the reader aligns himself with, as being the, the text itself, or the sole interpretation of the text, he calls this uh, an author, authoritarian uh, kind of way of looking at religious authority. Religious authority, does it allow interpretation or does it give the laity, those who are not trained in religion, interpretive license? And as interpretive license is what Kirsten calls it in his book. Uh, Al-Qarafi, looking at the Maliki school and uh, contrasting that with Shiism, describes religious authority, especially jurisprudential authority in the Maliki school, as a ladder whereby those at the lower rungs of the ladder are able to interpret the rulings or the uh, interpretations of texts that those above them on the ladder have. They, are then, they then have some license to interpret um, the rulings of those above them and he calls this takhrij. Of course, I'm not a uh, specialist in, in Maliki fiqh, but those who are can, can uh, correct me if I'm completely off barking up the wrong tree. Coming to Shi'ism specifically, religious authority in Shi'ism is quite different or has specific features which are not there outside of the Shi'i context. First of all, it is personified in that religious authority, of course, Quran and Hadith are religiously authoritative. The Prophet was religiously authoritative and what we have from his Sunnah across all the den denominations of Islam is religiously authoritative. However, those religious scriptures and texts, Quran, Hadith, Sunnah, then need human interpretation, uh, or conduits if you like, who then interpret those texts and give us uh, what is to be done on a day-to-day -day basis. And in the Shi'i framework, that's very much uh, monopolized by jurists, as we call them in, in Shia Islam, the maraja, which is in the Arabic plural of the word marja. Marja meaning uh, a resource that one reverts back to, an authority that one reverts back to. Of course, books can also be called marja in a wider context, but in Shi authority um, vernacular, if you like, the maraja would be referred to as those religious jurists who are primarily based in Iran and in Iraq, in the cities of Najaf and in Qum in Iran, uh, a clique of scholars, if you like, and authority has really been monopolized uh, by this small group of people in the Shi'i context. Beyond that, again, which is something unlike non-Shi'i Islam, religious authority has the backing of theological rhetoric behind it as well. Some of you might know that, or most of you will probably know, that 12 Shia Muslims believe in a hidden Imam who is in occultation living at the moment and in occultation hidden. The Mujtahid or the Maraja in Shia Islam are seen to be his deputies. And therefore, as you can see uh, here in this excerpt, the Maraja are seen to be the deputies of that hidden Imam and therefore the hidden Imam who is believed in Shiism to be infallible and sinless has the authority of God. And therefore that means the maraja as a stretch or branching out from that, ensuing from that authority, 
also have, if you like, kind of the, the rhetoric behind it is that they would have the authority that God wants you to do this or doesn't want you to do that. And of course, you might also be well aware that the term or the epithet in Shia Islam given to the mujtahids is Ayatullah such and such, which literally means in Arabic the sign of Allah. I remember reading uh, a chapter from a book by uh, Dr. Sheikh Haider Hubbullah, who was very critical of this, saying that, and it came in the Safavid period, he said this, this title of Ayatullah was coined in the Safavid period. What it does, he argues, is that it gives very little ability for people to critique the opinions because you're telling everyone that this person, you've given him the title, of course, all of us and everything around us and trees and mountains are all signs of Allah. But once you particularize this person and pedestalize a group of people as the signs of Allah, it's very difficult. And you give them that rhetoric, it's very difficult then um, to critique their opinions. And therefore that might give this aspect of authority in Shia Islam an authoritarian tinge to it. And that's why we're looking at epistemic authority. Of course, it wasn't me who coined this term. I can't remember who came up with the word epistemic authority, but I can look that up for you at some point. Um, so, epistemic authority would mean that the one who has more knowledge, if you like, has more authority. But at what point, as we just described right now, does that become authoritarian? Authority, as Le uh, Professor Liaqat Takim says in his book, when it's, tr it's strictly defined and hierarchical as it is in Shiism, of course he is an insider, he himself um, is someone who identifies as a Shia Muslim, reduces the chances of digression and the scope of divergent hermeneutics. For most devout Shi'i, the maraj's pronouncements are final and beyond critique, even beyond any intellectual critique. And of course, with the rhetoric we've seen right now, you can understand why that would be. There is also the social aspect of when it comes tied into that, when one practices their religion in the way it has been established, as orthopraxy is defined, of course there are social pressures there as well. Uh, this is an excerpt or a quotation from uh, Sayyid, a very influential scholar in Toronto, Canada, Sayyid Muhammad Rizvi, uh, who said, in, in, uh, and he's quoted to have said, the marja of taqlid, again that, that person we revert back to, to do taqlid, who is seen to be the representative of the hidden imam, the supreme leader of the Shia during the time of ghayba, ghayba means the occultation, the hidden, the imam being hidden. Do you think you are going to reject the recommendation of a person of that status? Of course it was a very rhetorical question, saying how absurd it would be for someone to critique the recommendations of someone in that position. And so we're looking at taqlid as a mechanism. Of course, as I mentioned at the beginning, taqlid, the term itself, is not exclusive to Shiism and is used across the five schools or jurisprudential schools in Islam. But the way it's defined and practiced in Shiism uh, is a bit more specific. So we're looking at uh, taqlid as described as being central to Shiism. So now we're attaching the practice of taqlid to lived Shiism itself, or the identity of being a Shia Muslim, the performance of taqlid is tied into that, as Clark um, speaks about it. And of course, uh, Shia books in Syria, Shia children's books, from a very young age, they were designed in a way that would teach Shia children to practice taqlid, uh, as you can see on the right hand side uh, as well. And of course, the, the white boxes at the bottom are the uh, references for those. Oops, wrong way. But we're looking here at taqlid in Shiism in two ways. One is how it's theoretically defined, which is just behind the ribbon up there, and two, how it's performed, which are sometimes quite different. How it's defined theoretically, epistemic uh, authority. The believer who has not studied reverts to the authority of the expert. Someone in Shiism who has not studied jurisprudence the laity, if you like, has to revert back to uh, the authority, the marja. And that just seems rational. It's an epistemic authority. And in many books of Shiism, you would find uh, analogies to a mechanic or a doctor. If something goes wrong with my car, I don't know what to do with it. I would take it to the mechanic, who is the expert in that field. If something goes wrong with my health, 
I would take, you, take myself, if you like, to the doctor, who's the expert in health. So that's how it's um, theorized, if you like. Also in the theory of it, uh, here in Ayatollah Sistani, Sayyid Sistani, who is presently perhaps the most prominent Shi'i jurist in Najaf in Iraq, describes taqlid, and if we just look at the first excerpt for the time being, obligatory on every individual who is charged with religious duties. So every uh, Muslim who is sane, uh, past the age of, uh, of maturity, whereby things become uh, obligatory upon them. At that point, taqlid would be obligatory on them. Why? As a rational principle, because I don't know what to do. I need to revert back to the expert in this. So for that, it is obligatory on every single person to refer to the marja, to do taqlid of the marja. Seems authoritarian. He goes on, however, say, to say, unless they are certain, that's the individual who is the lay person, the untrained person, unless they are certain that their deed or non-performance of any deed will not result in something compulsory being contravened. So basically, I do have agency. If I have the knowledge to say doing X and Y action is legitimate for me, I don't have to do taqlid here. So the highest and the most prominent Shi'i jurist in the world today is defining taqlid in this way. So this is the theory. However, so it does in a way afford interpretive agency in a way to someone who claims that they have knowledge in their own context. How it's practiced, however, the established performance is quite different. And we can see here again from Professor Takim, Taqlid generates confidence in the believers that their religious practices based on the judicial pronouncements of the marja approximate the will of God. This is the idea it's giving to Shi'i Muslims. Also saying here, uh, this is, uh, of course, it's written by this individual. However, they are quoting from Professor Abdul Aziz Sachidina, uh, who is talking about Taqlid in this way. He talks about Taqlid as blind acceptance, the way it's performed, not the theory behind it. The theory seemed rational as epistemic authority of the one of, of the expert. The way it's performed, however, in Shi'i society gives the marja some mystification and leads to, blind, I put in yellow there, blind acceptance of his rulings or of his opinions. And he's very critical of this. He says, in, and of course, Professor Sachidina himself is a uh, self-identifying as a 12 Shia Muslim. He says, in the age of democratization of knowledge and authority, this kind of practice is um, absurd. Part of my research, now these green boxes are taken out of the data of my research and we can see that authoritarian appreciation of Shi'i authority coming through. Salman, of course, an alias, uh, said, and he was talking about, this was in the context of organ donation and I know uh, Dr. Mansour Ali has been working on that quite a lot and we can go on about what, what the Shi'i prevalent jurisprudential rulings are about this. Um, but he was referring to the ruling that says, of course, that posthumously, she or Muslims are not allowed to donate their organs to non-Muslims. In any case, he speaks about the saying, he was disagreeing with that in his mind, however, he said, because they are more knowledgeable than me, I just have to take it and move on. So you can see that authoritarian attitude or the authoritarian perception of authority he has as a Shia Muslim. I try to understand why, but maybe I just don't have the knowledge to make that kind of decision on my own. Kumail, again an alias, in 2017 said, about the rulings of Ayatul Sistani, you can criticize him, but at the end of the day, he's still your marja, your authority, which you refer back to. So you still have to follow him. You might think, this doesn't make sense to me, whether it be about playing chess or organ donation or whatever it might be. However, you still have to follow him as an obligation. And therefore, we can see not only epistemic authority, but epistemic authoritarianism coming in in how Shi'i taqlid is practiced. However, now we're going to how this established practice of Shi'i authority was being reimagined and reconstructed as part of my research or individuals endorsing agency, interpretive, religious interpretive agency for themselves in a number of ways. So Hiba, for example, said, I'm not going to take what someone says and just take that as 100%. Every single person on earth has a different idea about something and that doesn't change when it comes to the scholars, the maraj. So I'm there to think for myself. He might have an opinion. 
I say he because of course the Marajah and this is the aspect we were not able to go into today are invariably male and that's jurisprudentially stipulated as well. We can go into that in the Q&A if time allows and if anyone's interested in that. In any case, so she is ready to use her own agency uh, and doesn't agree with everything 100%. Sadia at uh, a university in the Midlands said, I feel it's also our responsibility if what I'm going to say might be bad, or it might be bad what I'm about to say, and this was in the brackets, but if I consulted a marja on something, if they said something, if it doesn't sit well with me, then I'm not going to go with it. And just to highlight here, she's qualifying what she's saying here, it might be bad. What I'm about to say might... Recognizing that what I'm about to say doesn't fall within established, practiced Shiism. She recognizes this and that's why she's qualified it with this statement here. And then she goes on to say, She's using her own morality, of course. If it's not morally right, I probably won't go with it. But still, she says probably means she probably, she might go with it. Again, coming back to what Hiba said uh, about organ donation, which you've mentioned already. She said, I'm signed up as an organ donor. Now look what she's doing. It says in the Quran that if you save one, uh, one life, you saved humanity. So she's referring. She hasn't had any seminary education. So she's untrained in traditional Islam and jurisprudence. But she is referring to text to practice some kind of interpretation, uh, to, so circumventing those conduits of God's authority, if you like, the maraja, going straight to the text, interpreting it for herself, and saying, I'm signed up as an organ donor, even though the prevalent uh, an Ayatollah Sistani is certainly his ruling is that, as I already mentioned, posthumously Muslims wouldn't be allowed to donate their organs to non Muslims. So here you can see in, uh, one instance of direct reference to text for deduction of what the ruling for her should be. We have the issue of hijab here as well. And, uh, and again, gender issues became a very salient theme in my research. It's very interesting what she's saying here. Now she's referring to, she was a self-confessed muqallada, or muqallida rather, someone who was following doing the taqlid of Ayatollah Sistani. And his rulings on the hijab in, in the headscarf are quite stringent. She says, and of course I was interviewing her, her own headscarf was, um, she had it almost around her shoulders. She had her uh, hands bare up to the elbows, which in, according to the rulings of Ayatollah Sistani, would be impermissible. She's saying this, my marja, again Ayatollah Sistani, is not saying it's wrong, he's very open. As long as you're fulfilling your idea of hijab, of course that's not at all what he says. And I don't know where she picked up this kind of idea that, that he's very open about this. He's actually not very puritanical and very strict about it. She says about, I, I pushed her about, well, you're wearing this and that's not his ruling at all if you're claiming to follow him. She said, that's not the ruling, but that's what I interpret from the ruling in my given context. So she recognizes it's not the ruling. And therefore we can see a kind of resemblance to what I described as Al-Qarafi's description of what happens in the Maliki school. So a different way in which uh, this Shia Mus Muslimah is reconstructing practice of Shia authority and performance of Shia authority to give herself some interpretive agency. So here we see another instance from Yusra of Again, I don't know if you're aware of this, uh, people who are working in medicine and, and clinical practice are aware that they have a stipulation there where anyone is not allowed to clothe themselves below the elbows. They call it BBE, bare below the elbows policy. And of course, with uh, the rulings on hijab in Shiism, or at least the jurists like Ayatollah Sistani, Ayatollah Khamenei in Iran, none of, this, none of that would be permissible. So she, this uh, Yusra is saying, we have to roll our sleeves up to the elbow. That's not something I would do generally when I'm out and about, but I adapt uh, to that because obviously it's because of, uh, to avoid risk. So because of risk infection, she's using this. And look what she says uh, thereafter. Uh, for me, near the bottom, for me, it wasn't a big deal. Or just before that, to me, because it's for the greater good. I feel that my arm being shown was such a petty thing compared to the reason why it's being done. So she's not recourse to any text. 
she's not re- uh, going back to any verse of the Quran, unlike Hiba earlier on about organ donation. She's not referring to any hadith, any scripture, or even the opinions of any of the maraja and saying, that's his opinion, but I interpret it in this way, as we saw with Fahima just recently now. She's not referring to anyone. She's just saying, for me personally, this is not an issue because I feel it's for the greater good and to avoid um, in risk of uh, infection. So again, a different way in which uh, she has uh, used or reinterpreted or reconstructed practiced, established Shi authority to give herself agency. Zahra here, there is some evidence that not being bare below the elbows could transmit infection between patients and practitioners. Now, as a Muslim, so now she's not referring to the Quran directly, nor to the Hadith, nor to the rulings of any of the Maraja saying I'm interpreting in, in this way. She's saying as a Muslim, so she's giving her interpretation of wider Islamic values. As a Muslim and a working professional, if I'm putting my patients at risk, that's not allowed. And she's aware she's contravening the rulings of the maraja in being bare below the elbows in terms of her observance of hijab. So we've seen, uh, of course, my thesis was in a lot more detail and I had many more instances of data, but for the purpose of the presentation, we've seen different instances and different ways in which these higher education students, Shia Muslims, manage to, in their own ways, reconstruct uh, and reimagine performed Shia authority in a way that gives themselves agency or interpretive agency in their own actions. Of course, right at the beginning, we also saw people who were very much in line and conforming with established Shi performance of agency, saying, well, if that's what he said, that's what I'm going to do, and that's end of story, and looking at um, their authority as authoritarian and abiding by that. But then we saw instances of, of different differences as well. So all of the examples we've seen later on, um, again, diverge away from what might be called uh, Shi orthopraxy, and that way they've given themselves interpretive agency. It's a mistake and it has been done by Linda Walbridge, by Liaqat Takim, who we mentioned earlier, and I've critiqued them in my thesis, um, to align or to make a correlation between she devotedness and following that strict, rigid model of performed authority. Why? Because all of my research participants were members of the Ahl Bayt Shi Student Society, which already shows they are invested in their own Shiism, they identify as Shia Muslims, and despite that, they are reconstructing, and so, so they're, very, they're very active on campus, they're representing their Shiism to the wider campus, and despite that, they, are, they have reinterpreted or reconstructed those models of authority to give themselves agency. I think that's what I've just said really, isn't it? <laughs> in point number three. And so also, uh, looking at what we've often done with, uh, or what maybe in the past what's happened with looking at Muslims in the UK or Muslims generally, are often essentialized as one kind of expression or one kind of ethnic background. I really don't want to do that with Shia Muslims either. We saw a whole host of different performances and different interpretations from one end of the spectrum where my participants were really towing the line and conforming with established Shiism in practice to those who are reinterpreting it and uh, reconstructing in all different ways as well. But doing all of that still working together under one uh, student society to represent one face of Shiism to the wider uh, student society at university. I think that's it. And yeah, brilliant, wonderful.